Hey, everybody. Welcome to Chapter 19. Jeez, this is the last chapter in Unit 2 on the Solar System. Congratulations, we've made it. This is on small bodies, meteors, asteroids, comets, and all of the good things. This image, by the way, right here is of a, uh, the second largest asteroid. Its name is Vesta. You're going to hear a little bit more about this when we get going. This, as this asteroid has differentiated a core. This is an object that's probably only 500 kilometers across. That's very small. That's probably half the diameter of Ceres, remember, which is the biggest asteroid. So this is a remarkable object. Let me tell you a little bit more about meteors and meteorites. Um, meteors, of course, are small bodies that fly into the atmosphere, get hot, and generally burn up. <clears throat> if any of them survive to reach the ground, they're called a meteorite, okay? <laughs> And that happens actually quite often. Meteorites, not to be uh, confused with meteors, come in three types, the irons, the stony irons, and the stonies. Now these are the ones that are particularly interesting because uh, you can't have an iron meteorite unless you have a differentiated body that is the so-called parent body for the meteorite. There's no way to do it without a differentiated body. So what must have happened is whatever it was, and it was probably Vesta, differentiated a core, even though it was a small body, and it then itself suffered an impact. And I'll show you how this works. The same is true for stony irons. Large iron meteorites that I'm sure many of you have seen in, in all sorts of museums have what are called Wiedmannstatten patterns, nice German words that suggest they cooled slowly and they're spectacular but they're a result of differentiation probably in asteroids. Now, the reason people are so hot about certain types of meteorites, particularly those called carbonaceous chondrites, are because they're pristine. They go way back to the origin of the solar system. They have, get this, organic chemicals, amino acids, I heard that, and water which suggests that these are the original, some of the original materials that accreted into the planets. So there's the number one reason we care about meteorites so much is because they give us clues to the original material, which uh, coalesced and condensed and then ultimately accreted into the planets. The second reason, by the way, we'll get to a little bit later, and that is the impact threat that some of these asteroids pose to humans. Um, now, <clears throat> most of you have probably heard of meteor showers. They occur at several times during the year. Uh, they're always fun. Meteors are a lot of fun to observe. Uh, probably the most famous meteor shower is the Perseid. They're always named for the constellation from which they come. Meteor showers are always seen best after midnight and if there's no uh, bright moon around and if you're in a dark sky. That's all you need and you have to have your eyes open. <laughs> But the funny thing is the Perseids and all the other meteor showers are associated with comet orbits. Uh, Perseids are associated with a comet called Swift-Tuttle. And so every year on the, at, they peak it on August 12th. They give you about 60 meteors per hour, which is about one a minute. And uh, they're a lot of fun. Now the uh, a, a comet Halley is associated with two meteor showers at different times of the year, the Eta Aquarids and the Orionids. Obviously, the Orionids are seen in Orion. So we know where the meteors come from. They come from cometary orbits. Now, let's get back to the origin of meteorites. Meteorites are much stronger materials that can actually survive the passage through the atmosphere. That means they have to be particularly the iron meteorites and the stony irons. Here is what we believe Vesta looked like. It had differentiated a core and it had silicate materials around the edge. And unfortunately, you're not, <laughs> my corner down here is blocking. But there was a uh, impact into Vesta, or it's also called the parent body. And so what happens, it shattered a lot of the uh, asteroid. Some of it was actually pure iron. Some of it was iron mixed with silicates. Some of it was pure silicates. And that's what we see in meteorites coming from differentiated bodies. Now, asteroids look like this. <clears throat> asteroids are usually uh, irregular rocky bodies. Irregular means they're not round. That's what we're trying to say here. Rocky means they have more rocks than they have volatiles. An example of a volatile is like water. 
or it could be carbon dioxide, or it could be methane, or something like that. So these bodies generally don't have a lot of water, and generally they are regular rocky bodies. The largest one I just mentioned before is Ceres. This one is round, <laughs> just to confuse the whole issue again. It is round, but it's under 1,000 kilometers in diameter. By the way, you, you may know that the Earth is over 12,000 kilometers in diameter. So these things are very much smaller than planets. This one is found in the main belt. That's, we'll talk about that downstream here too. And since it's round, it is, its modern designation <laughs> is as a dwarf planet. We'll explain more about that in two seconds. Now, just to give you an idea about how many asteroids there are, there are more than one million asteroids with diameters larger than uh, one kilometer. A kilometer is like 0.6, just over half a mile. And of course, there are many more than a million smaller than that size. That's a lot of uh, particles. Here's a, an image up close and personal with Eros, the second largest near-Earth object. It's 17 kilometers in diameter, uh, taken by the near spacecraft. If this thing hit the Earth, that would be a bad sink. That'd be a global, that'd have global implications. Uh, by the way, near-Earth objects are asteroids that have Earth-crossing orbits that might collide with the Earth in the next hundred years. Okay, so that's the way to think about this. And now the origin of asteroids, I'll tell you in a sec. The asteroid belt I mentioned before is between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. The estimated mass of all the asteroids in the so-called main belt is only 4% of the moon's mass. That's not very much. The so-called near-Earth asteroids, I was just talking about those, cross the Earth's orbit and could impact the Earth in the next century. There's no forecast that any one of them will, but they all could. Trojan asteroids, these are special asteroids trapped in various positions in Jupiter's orbit. Uh, where these things all came from is it's believed, for the most part, they're leftovers, friends, from planetary accretion. And guess why they didn't form planets? It's almost uh, crossed off here. But Jupiter's gravity field is so strong that between about 2 and 4 AUs, remember the Earth is at 1 AU, uh, Jupiter's gravity field did not allow these guys to, to settle into any sort of planet formation. Now, comets in the Earth cloud. Comets are different than asteroids, but not much. <laughs> the main difference here is, to be honest, is uh, the amount of volatiles, the amount of things like water and gases that easily uh, gasify at low temperature. Uh, comets have lots of volatile rich uh, materials. They're generally less than 10 kilometers in size. They're always from the outer solar system because that's the only place they can survive. The outer solar system is the only place that's cold enough to make to give comets a long life. As you'll see, when they approach the sun, they develop tails. These are kind of famous. Uh, to give you some numbers, say the so-called Oort cloud is a cloud that uh, supposedly has a trillion, that's 10 to the 12th power, a trillion comets in it. That's an estimate. The cloud itself extends from 10,000 AUs. Remember, the Earth dis Earth's sun distance is 1 AU to 100,000 AUs. This is a gigantic thing. 100,000 U's is one third of the distance to the nearest star, Alpha Centauri. Um, orbits of these comets are, are not in the ecliptic. That's the plane of the Earth's orbit. Um, they always have periods, the time that they need to go around the sun once. They are over 200 years. And this is a perfect example, Comet hale -Bopp. You may have heard of this comet. I, um, it was one of the brighter comets of the uh, 20th century, 1997. This thing, now get this, had an, its orbit was inclined 90 degrees to the ecliptic. That means that if this is the Earth's orbit right here, the comet's orbit was like this. At a 90 degree angle, it was going around at a 90 degree angle compared to our orbit. That means we're not going to get hit by it. It's just the odds are astronomically against. But this is the big number, 60 kilometer nucleus. Holy macaroni, that's over 35 miles in diameter. If that thing had hit the Earth, that would be a dinosaur type impact. And that's not something anybody would want to see. Fortunately, this puppy is not coming back for over 2000 years, at least to our vicinity. It is from the Oort cloud. Now, 
Uh, we can't hide from any more friends. We've got to talk about how we define a planet. <laughs> this is a political issue. Um, now here's the standard definition, um, and I'll show you what people did to change it. A planet must be round. That means it can't be irregular like the asteroid Eros I showed you is. It's got to orbit a star, and it cannot be a star itself or a satellite of a planet. So for example, Ganymede, this humongous uh, moon of Jupiter, uh, would be a planet if it were in orbit around the sun directly, but it's orbiting Jupiter, that means it's a moon, okay? The solar system, as you know, has eight right now. Pluto, now here's the deal. This is where the International Astronomical Union decided, they made an executive decision <laughs> to avoid having Ceres, this big round asteroid, or Pluto, formerly the ninth planet, to avoid either one of these being a planet, they added this clause, it, the planet, to be a planet, it must have, quote, cleared its neighborhood of other orbiting bodies. Presumably by the strength of its gravity, it would grab them and force them to impact it. Okay, that's what the Earth did and that's what other planets did. Um, and this is bogus, of course, it's kind of manufactured and people are, uh, ticked off about the whole thing, but you know, that's kind of the way it is now. Uh, Ceres, this big round asteroid, uh, three so-called Kuiper Belt objects. Uh, Kuiper Belt objects are in orbits in, in the ecliptic from Neptune's distance, that's 30 AUs, out to 50 AUs. So that's a long way out in the outer solar system. Then also Pluto is considered to be a Kuiper Belt object and one what's called a scattered disk object. All you have to know about that is that they go out to 100 AUs. And by the way, they're not in the ecliptic. It's all, you know, not much is known about these objects, but all of these, these five objects I just mentioned suddenly became called dwarf planets. That's supposed to mean something. It means they're not regular planets, okay? And the reason was they wanted to have planets be something special. This is still a controversy that hasn't completely gone away yet, but now you know how we define a planet. Now let's talk about uh, impact threats. Um, these are real. In all of, across the entire Earth, people have found about 175 impact craters. See, there are probably zillions all over the Earth. Most of them have been destroyed by erosion. This isn't like the moon here, of course. We got water and wind and who knows what, constantly change, destroying things on the continents. We've got subduction, constantly destroying things on the ocean floor. Um, and a perfect example is Meteor Crater in North Arizona. If you've ever been to Arizona, you probably saw this place. Way back in 1960, they first realized it really was an impact and not a volcano or something. The impact occurred about 50,000 years ago. It's less than a mile in diameter. It's a great tourist attraction. It's up by uh, Flagstaff, as a matter of fact. Here's one down in the Yucatan. This is uh, probably the most famous impact crater uh, on the Earth, the Chicxulub crater. This is the, this is the big enchilada, friends. Uh, this occurred 65 million years ago when a large, are you ready? Large impact of an asteroid created a crater just under 100 miles in diameter. That's huge. Uh, most of it's submerged, by the way, under the water. Caused, this thing is believed to have caused a mass extinction event that terminated the dinosaurs, got rid of those big, ugly dinosaurs, and 75% of all plant and animal species on Earth. So this changed the world. <laughs> And it took people a long time to find the crater associated with this, but it is uh, the Chicxulub crater. It is in the North Yucatan. It is real. Now, the question is, these, these other events we were talking about happened a long time ago, but there are more recent impacts. The Chelyabinsk one that occurred in Russia in 2013. If that thing had hit, it would have released something like 30 times the energy of the Hiroshima bomb, which ended World War II. Uh, the Tunguska was even bigger and worse although that was back in 1908. But these more recent impacts or near impacts suggest that um, the whole impact threat is a regional thing, is a real thing that people have to be worried about. And so that's it for small bodies.